Hi, and welcome to this first part in a four-part video series introducing you to the Nordic Circular Economy Playbook by Nordic Innovation. This video will focus on why transforming your linear business model makes perfect business sense. We hope it provides you with new and useful learnings. I will now hand it over to Hedda. Thank you, Alice. I will now elaborate a bit more on the opportunities we see within circular economy and the value it creates. Because many of our products today are created through a linear process in terms of production and consumption. And this typically starts with uh, product design, sourcing, manufacturing, going all the way through product use and end of life disposal. But we know that this kind of linear value chains generate a lot of inefficiencies. And circular economy is about reducing these inefficiencies and turning them into value by disconnecting economic growth from resource consumption. Our research shows that uh, $4.5 trillion can be unlocked from global linear economies by 2030 if we apply the circular economy at scale. And looking at the Nordic economies, this translates to around 140 billion uh, US dollars. But what are these inefficiencies? The linear value chains generate five types of inefficiencies. For example, inefficiencies are generated when we use unsustainable material and energy into our products. Looking at the product use phase, inefficiencies also occur when we're not fully utilizing our products or when we scrap them too early because they're out of date or they lack the required functionality. We're also seeing inefficiencies at the end of the life of products when we fail to recover the embedded materials and the energy that are within our products. And finally, when we fail to engage our customers throughout the whole product life cycle, that means that more potential for value creation is also lost. So how do we seize this uh, value? We seize it by employing five different circular business models that transforms our linear approaches into circular approaches which uh, reduces or even minimize the waste and the inefficiencies that currently occurs. And if you look at the first business model, we call it circular inputs. And this focuses on using uh, sustainable materials and energy into our products. But it also focuses on how to design the product for a long life. And one example of this is the Finnish manufacturer Vatsila. Vatsila employs a simplified modular design to their engines. And this simplified design allows them to get their products faster to the market, to streamline their maintenance processes, and to reduce uh, the spare parts that they need on storage. Moving over to the product use phase, um, we're seeing sharing platforms being employed, uh, where users can share access to products that are often idle. And one very, very well-known example of this is Airbnb that allows apartment owners to rent out their empty apartments to visitors and thereby increasing the utilization rate of their apartments. We're also seeing how companies are employing uh, product use extension models that focuses on repairing, upgrading, reselling or remanufacture the products. And one example of this is the Swedish uh, manufacturer Scania. Scania has invested uh, in remanufacturing capabilities. So they actually take back used equipment from their customers, repair it, and then sell it back to the market. Another uh, business model that also focuses on incentivizing um, a longer life of the product is the product as a service model. And here, the manufacturer retains the ownership of the product and only leases it to the customer. And this immediately incentivizes uh, the manufacturer to invest in a product that has a long life because that increases the value of the product. And one example is the Nordic company Temporary Space. Temporary Space rent out building modules to customers that need the extra capacity, for example, kindergartens. And when the customers don't need that extra capacity, Temporary Space take it back and lease it to other customers and thereby increasing the utilization rate of their space. 
And finally, we have resource recovery. This business model focuses on uh, returning the embedded materials and energy back into the production cycle, closing the loop. And one example here is the Norwegian construction group Asgruppen. They have developed a technology that harvests and clean construction materials. And at the moment, they're actually able to extract 80% of the mass from a construction waste into reusable mass. And if you take a look to the Nordics, uh, we're seeing how many of the companies are adopting um, sustainable materials and energy and also product use extension models. And we're also seeing an increasing interest um, as for the product as a service business model. And how companies typically start is that they typically start by looking at their internal processes and the waste that occurs there. And this is because this typically builds upon existing efficiency initiatives that they have. It has shorter paybacks in terms of business case and is often confined within their own organization. But when companies start to adjust their products and services, this is typically a bit more complicated because this is how they're known to their customers, their employees and their investors. So starting to transform these kind of offerings takes a bit more time. But what kind of value can we actually get out of circular economy? We see that uh, circular economy business models creates value in four different dimensions, both in terms of um, uh, in, the, in the short term and in the long term. And if you look to the short term, we're seeing how the circular business models contributes to revenue growth, for example, by increasing sales or extending the product portfolio. And one example here is uh, the Finnish uh, forestry company, Metsa. Metsa currently sells 92% of their side streams to other companies. So they're able to actually create revenue streams from waste. We're also seeing how companies are using the business models to reduce cost. For example, by reducing material and energy consumption or reducing the production cost. And one example here is the Swedish uh, energy company Stockholm XAG. They are reusing excess heat from data centers to actually heat 10,000 households in Stockholm, which are then, of course, decreasing the total cost that they use on energy. But if we look more to the long term, we also have the more intangible benefits, such as brand enhancement. And we're clearly seeing how companies are eager to link their brand to the circular economy effort to signal a positive um, effect to their stakeholders. Another important uh, value driver is risk reduction, both in terms of reducing reputational risk, but also in terms of reducing uh, the risk of operational disruption. For example, um, one third of the materials that is used in a new Volvo truck comes from recycled material. And this means that Volvo reduces their reliance on volatile commodity markets, strengthening their supply chain. So this was a quick summary uh, of the opportunities and the value creation. But if you are interested in actually understanding what your opportunities are, we recommend you to take a look at the business model toolkit that you can find on the web page. And now I will hand it over to Alexander, who will talk to our guests a bit more about this topic. Thank you, Hedda. We have talked to the innovation manager, Kristin Lake at Nordic Recycler Norsk Kjenning to hear how they are creating circular value. Take a look at this. Welcome, Christina. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So being one of the largest uh, recyclers and waste management companies in the Nordics, um, what role has Norsk Gjenning uh, in the circular economy? It's a good question. I think um, um, if you look back in time, you would look at our um, company and our um, sector as the, the sector that actually comes latest in the value chain. So we're sort of the last actor. Whereas when you um, start thinking about our role in a circular economy, uh, actually our role is uh, pretty central for, for all the actors coming before us. Um, and it really starts with a dialogue uh, with the first actor on how you design anything you make, because that really um, sets the basis for what's possible to do with it when it ends up at our place. And of course, our goal is to ensure that 
as much of the waste that we receive as possible is really turned into a new attractive raw material that can compete with anything primary. So that is of course our aim to, to really accelerate the world's transition to a circular economy and, um, and doing that we need to, we need to really uh, cooperate with all the, other, um, all the other actors in the value chain. You already mentioned the, the partners and the customers. Uh, so what kind of circular value do you see that Norsk Invening can create for your customers? And also, uh, how are you then enabling your customers to create competitive advantage? Uh, I think more and more we're seeing that um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's probably going to be a situation where you see that circularity is, uh, is actually a license to operate. And uh, being able to, um, to really reduce your negative um, sort of footprint or aspects of wh whatever you're doing is something that customers, I mean, the customers of our customer is more and more um, interested in and, and also follows up on. And uh, it also relates to the regulations and what's coming from the EU, uh, specifically in, in Europe, of course. But uh, what we can do is uh, very often uh, provide our customers, uh, at least in those situations where we uh, develop something together with them, uh, we can provide a product that really reduces their, um, their negative CO2 footprint. Uh, and they can have uh, products and uh, services on the market, which competes not just on price, but also uh, on sustainability. Can you also uh, go a bit further into a client case to share with us? Of course. Um, one of our uh, greatest examples actually is uh, from the construction sector. Uh, we're working very closely with um, gypsum producer Nordips. What they do is they, pro uh, they produce uh, gypsum plates or board, gypsum board. Um, from primarily they would use uh, first hand uh, primary raw material, uh, which is imported from Europe. Um, gypsum powder, which goes into the, their production. Uh, what we've set up uh, through a close partnership with them is actually uh, taking the gypsum waste that uh, appears in Norway. It's uh, approximately 100,000 tons per year. Uh, half of this we can take to our factory. <coughs> we can recycle it. And what comes out of this recycling process is a product which is so pure and of such a high quality that it can compete with them. Um, primary raw materials. So this means that uh, from our perspective we can also actually give them a local um, source to just as good a raw material as their uh, traditional uh, more uh, long distance uh, traveled source. And another benefit of this is actually the fact that we don't have to send this gypsum waste that is created in Norway uh, to landfills. And it's quite a big deal uh, when it comes up to 100,000 tons per year. So you really reduce something, which is a problem, because there is no other way of handling this kind of waste um, except from either landfill or, or then turning it into this, um, this new raw material. We see in the Nordics that there's a huge value potential moving towards circularity. So with your partners, your customers, uh, what value do you see companies are missing out on if they don't move towards circularity? Uh, there's several aspects here, I think. Um, of course, there is, uh, there is the fact that um, uh, you, n you never really know when sort of the big wave comes and hits you. So uh, one threat is that if you're waiting too long, you can also miss out on the opportunities of really um, creating that area to play uh, where you can get the partners you want and you can create also uh, and be sort of the first mover uh, of creating new um, products, services that are more uh, com um, competitive uh, going forward. But I also think that um, uh, it's a risk to really be sort of the last player to move because uh, you're not really showing how you want to um, contribute to really moving the world forward. And uh, we see uh, so many aspects here that our customers are most often the, the leading players within their sectors uh, that want to sort of not just uh, make a difference for themselves, but they're, they're really creating the road forward for also their entire sector so that they too can move with them 
So I think being part of that and really showing that um, you you also see that this is the future we want to create is um, uh, is very much of value, not just for for your own um, company, but also for the sector and really building your your brand. I would guess that you have so many different success factors uh, that you have uh, seen in Norsk Enuning um, over time, but can you mention kind of one critical success factor that uh, you see as uh, a key learning uh, from uh, Norsk Enuning, also how you're working with your uh, customers and, and partners to, to really move towards circularity? It's a good question and narrowing down to one is of course quite challenging, but um, uh, our perspective is that uh, without any kind of cooperation and really um, including the value chain of what you're uh, trying to achieve, uh, you're moving slower, of course, and, um, and you don't necessarily manage to make the change you want to make. So uh, uh, making um, partnerships and cooperating with uh, actors sort of both before you and after you in the value chain is... Uh, is probably the, the, the most important part uh, to be able to really set the stage and uh, succeed. Thank you, Christina, so much for uh, sharing your stories, your experience, uh, and also for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're also joined by Lara Blasberg from the Danish window manufacturer Velux, who's going to expand on what kind of value they're seeing from circular opportunities. Welcome, Lara. Thank you for inviting me. Can you briefly explain what kind of circular opportunities you're seeing within Velux? Absolutely. I'd just like to start with uh, saying that we have had in Velux uh, a model company approach since our inception in 1941, which for us is all about having a, an exemplary business that ensures it's making products that are useful to society, but also in a way that we treat all of our stakeholders in an excellent manner. And this means that, that we are um, internally prepared to, to tackle challenges uh, like transition to circular economy. Um, we look at this uh, from three different levels that I'll run through really briefly what's going on uh, inside Velux. And those three levels are on uh, the company level, on the product level, and in the building industry more broadly. So uh, within the company, um, the, the United Nations has referred to this as the decade of action. So it's very important for us in order to take the right actions that we have set appropriate targets. So 2021 is, is the year that we're really working on refining our circularity targets that fall under our broader sustainability strategy. And that broader sustainability strategy involves going carbon neutral by 2030 and an even bigger task of going completely lifetime carbon neutral by our 100 year anniversary in 2041. Um, on the product side uh, for, for working towards um, having those sharp circularity targets, our number one priority is to preserve raw materials and so in order to do that and, uh, and to make sure that we, we have the natural resources on our planet uh, that we need going forward, uh, we're working to enable uh, both recycling and uh, the reuse or refurbishment uh, of our products. And this works uh, quite well for us in terms of carbon accounting as well, which is going to be the... Uh, this sort of currency of the future, because we often see a synergy between coming up with circularity in, in products and how it's affecting um, our carbon accounting. Then last but not least is, is on the industry level. And in this way, we have an ambition to be a leader in how to build sustainably. And so this is also referring to uh, circular construction, um, but also how buildings are, are used, because the use phase of buildings to us is the most significant. It's uh, accounting for 40% of global carbon emissions. But even more importantly, if you, if you have a, a, a human being focus, we're spending the majority of our time indoors. So this, this matters a lot to us. Really interesting and, and glad to hear about your high ambitions in, in Velux on, on this transition. Um, if you go more into the value area, what are the main value areas that you believe these opportunities can bring to Velux, both short and long term? 
I think in the short term, the greatest value is learning how to do business in a different manner. And what I mean by that is um, circularity really highlights the significance of partnerships. So uh, we are getting better at working in, in partnerships and we're we're also uh, learning how to internalize that value so that, so that it becomes the basis of how we do all of our business going forward. Um, a couple examples of those are that we are already now in a, in a partnership with Schneider Electric, um, who they're going to help us uh, achieve our goal to become 100% uh, running on renewable energy by 2023. And uh, for that lifetime carbon neutrality goal I mentioned, um, we, we've established a partnership with um, the World Wildlife Fund, um, both to plant, protect forests, but also to work together to uh, improve the livelihoods of forest communities. So the, the, the in terms of value, what we see is, um, of course, we have the planet, and, and that's a, a key aspect of uh, circular economy. Uh, but we're also in the longer term um, developing ways of doing business that uh, that have have that really synergistic focus between protecting the planet, but also really making better lives for human beings and building better communities. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the opportunities and, and possible values around uh, circular economy. And first of all, also for joining us today, Lara. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care. I will now hand it over to Ellis, who will conclude. We hope you found this video useful in your circular journey. You can explore and start working with the playbook and the toolkit on our website. The second part in our serial series will tackle the topics of capability and technology gaps. Thank you for watching.